Hi there. We'd like to welcome everybody to um, the CPT based liquefaction analysis examples using the Slick version 2 software. Uh, so, this is going to be in a webinar, just basically working through the software, uh, showing some examples and, and how you can use the program to conduct a liquefaction analysis. The presenter will be Dr. Peter Robertson, and I will hand it over to Peter. Um, if you have any questions during the webinar, uh, we will spend some time at the end, about 15, 20 minutes answering questions. Feel free to type them in using the question feature in the webinar software. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Kelly. Welcome, everybody. As you can see, this is our 16th. Um, sorry, we forgot to share the screen. Um, yeah, so as I said, this is uh, number 16 uh, of our series of webinars. And it follows on from the previous one where we demonstrated the CPT interpretation software, CPTIT. And so, SLIC is a sort of a sister program that's designed specifically for liquefaction analysis using the CPT and it's built around the same framework as CPT so uh, it follows on nicely from the previous webinar but um, can't, I can't change the slide oh, okay. Okay. Um, yeah sorry uh, but before we uh, go into the software, what I want to do is sort of go through a couple of slides just to remind everybody about you know, the basic principles around liquefaction so that when we talk about it relative to the software, then you'll, have, uh, you'll be reminded about what it means. Um, so, of course, just a reminder that most things I'm going to say are available, uh, are they're covered in that CPT guide, which are, is available from a number of different uh, websites. And so just to remind ourselves again the definitions of liquefaction, there's two broad ones. One is the cyclic, sometimes referred to as seismic liquefaction. And this is where you can reach a condition of zero effective stress during cyclic loading. So essentially level or gently sloping ground in large earthquakes, uh, they cause shear stress reversal. And that shear stress reversal means that uh, under this rapid cyclic loading, uh, you can build up excess pore pressures to a degree where you essentially reach a condition of zero effective stress during the cyclic loading. And so during cyclic loading and under zero effective stress, uh, the soil essentially has no stiffness and so it can deform large amounts because of that loss of stiffness. Notice my phraseology there, it's, it's not a loss of strength, it's a loss of stiffness during cyclic loading and when you reach that condition of essentially zero effective stress. Um, and of course, uh, loose sands reach that much easier than denser sands, and clays uh, tend not to reach the condition of zero effective stress, so they don't lose all their stiffness. They can soften under large earthquake loading, uh, but they don't reach zero effective stress, so they don't experience cyclic liquefaction. The other definition is flow liquefaction, sometimes referred to as static liquefaction. And the reason static is put in there is it's not always triggered by uh, cyclic loading or earthquake loading. Sometimes it's simply just a, some static loading that's triggered uh, instability. And the instability is caused by the fact that the soil is strain softening in its response. And so in undrained shear, that strain softening means a loss of strength. And of course, that, that's not limited just to sands, whereas cyclic liquefaction tends to be more focused on sandy soils. Flow liquefaction can occur in a much wider range of soils, including very sensitive clays. Um, but you know, in the image shown here at Tailings Dam, they're often sandy uh, materials, which means they're often quite brittle if they're loose enough uh, to trigger this strain softening response. So, quick overview again. So, in terms of cyclic liquefaction, uh, that generally applies to what is often referred to as level ground or gently sloping ground, sort of um, sloping ground less than about five degrees, or level ground with a nearby um, slope or free face. And the sequence to evaluate seismic liquefaction is first of all, are the soils susceptible to cyclic liquefaction? And essentially, I said that sandy soils are more susceptible than. Um, silty soils and of course clays are generally not susceptible to cyclic liquefaction and so it's based on the plasticity of the soils and that was covered 
in a previous webinar. I've got the note at the bottom here. We did a webinar a couple of years ago on cyclic liquefaction part one. And um, so you can go to that uh, webinar. It's at the Greg uh, website uh, if you want to review that in detail. And then after you've determined if it's susceptible to cyclic liquefaction, you evaluate whether or not the earthquake is large enough to trigger cyclic liquefaction. And if it is, you then evaluate how much deformation has occurred, uh, will occur. And um, that's one of the big differences in, in recent years is in the past a lot of it was focused on the triggering and now more attention is given to uh, post-earthquake deformations, both settlements and lateral displacements um, yeah. and general damage. Okay, well, what, what, why don't we end it? No, let me end it and start it again. Sorry, everybody. Just to let you know, um, yeah, we noticed that it was uh, the presentation was stuck on that first slide, so we're just going to restart the PowerPoint um, and see if that helps. Did, did change. Uh, it can, it's got something to do with this this side piece here. Oh, show the screen. Okay, my apologies. Um, I was talking there, and you were you were diligently listening, but not seeing. Um... Okay, Cal. Now it's not changing. Okay, um, so okay, I'm on the second slide now, and this is was uh, quickly review. You heard my words, but it was just to remind you that what I'm going to say is covered on the guide. And this third slide was going over the definitions, which you you heard me explain it. So you've got cyclic liquefaction, which is zero effect of stress under cyclic loading, and flow liquefaction, which is strain softening response in undrained shear. So for cyclic liquefaction, you know, I said the sequence is, uh, is the soil susceptible to cyclic liquefaction? Will the earthquake trigger cyclic liquefaction? And then uh, increasing emphasis on what the post-earthquake deformations will be. And that's a recognition that you may in fact trigger cyclic liquefaction, but if it's only a very small amount uh, and either covered by or surrounded by much stiffer material that's not experiencing cyclic liquefaction, then deformations sometimes can be very small, even though cyclic liquefaction is triggered. Um, so th the procedure generally followed is often referred to as the simplified approach procedure, and this followed the earthquakes in Alaska and Nagata, Japan, back in the early 60s, and Professor uh, Seed and Idris, uh, back in the early 70s, uh, they suggested a, an approach, and often referred to as the simplified procedure, uh, where you first of all evaluate the seismic demand, which is the cy cyclic stress ratio, and then look at the resistance of the soil and compare that with the demand, and the resistance is referred to as the cyclic resistance ratio. So you see these acronyms, CSR for uh, seismic demand, and then CRR for the cyclic resistance ratio. And in the simplified procedure, Idris, uh, Seed and Idris had suggested the simplified formula to estimate the cyclic stress ratio uh, during an earthquake. And they uh, recommended that it sort of be normalized to a magnitude seven and a half earthquake and for an effective uh, overburden stress of one atmosphere. And so you've got this very simplified formula, which is a function of the peak ground acceleration and the ratio of the total to effective stress, and then a stress reduction factor. And then that is all divided by a magnitude scaling factor and a K sigma, which is to account for. Um, static shear stress. But since we're talking about predominantly level or gently sloping ground, K-sigma is, uh, is usually not that big an issue because generally the, the depth effect is quite small. Um, and so you'll see from the case histories that generally everything's um, less than about uh, 10 or 12 meters. So it's generally you know close to one atmosphere or less. So K-sigma typically doesn't play a major role for a lot of the case histories. Uh, now, of course, for design, if you're in bigger structures, it can become an issue, and 
uh, maybe we'll touch on that uh, when we look at the software. And then the cyclic resistance ratio, again, normalized to a magnitude 7.5 and, and an effective overburden of one atmosphere. And, of course, in the early days, people tried to do that from samples, and they really realized that uh, it was very difficult to get um, undisturbed samples of sands or sandy soils. And so in the last uh, 30 to 40 years, it's been dominated by penetration resistance. In the early days, the SPT and more recently, the CPT. And of course, that's what we're going to talk about today. So in the, since the 1980s, there's been several CPT-based methods developed. And you'll see that the software has a lot of the major ones embedded into it, so you can compare them. And just a quick review. Now we have over 250 case histories, and you know, with the um, earthquakes in Christchurch uh, five years ago, uh, that we've got a you know a now a massive number of additional case histories added to it. So the the number keeps increasing, uh, and the trigger curves are very well established. And this is a plot taken from Bollinger and Idris recently, where they showed uh, the red dots where the sites that uh, where liquefaction did occur. And you can see that they're mostly in the sandy region of the CPT um, normalized soil behavior type chart. So they're mostly sands and silty sands. And you notice that there essentially are no case histories with an IC greater than 2.6. And the white dots show that there are also sites in there that didn't liquefy. Um, and, um, and that's partly a function of uh, the size and magnitude of the earthquake. So for flow liquefaction, you know, you need a strain softening response in undrained shear. You need some trigger mechanism. It, it can be an earthquake, but also it could be static loading. And I'll show that in a, in a moment. And of course, you need the static shear stresses to be greater than the minimum or, or liquefied undrained shear strength that the soil eventually strain softens to. And then, of course, you need a kinematic mechanism. You need some geometry where um, deformations can occur. And I've noticed you have, I've got uncontained flow or contained deformations. So if you have small amounts of material that uh, potentially can strain soften, but they're surrounded by large amounts of strain hardening material, then flow liquefaction could be triggered in some of the soil, but uh, instability does not occur because the surrounding soil is strong enough to carry it. And I covered all of this in, in a, a, a webinar back a couple of years ago, and there's the the link to it if you want to be reminded of some of the details. But here's a nice plot, and I've taken this from Professor Olson and Stark. Um, and it's a very nice plot because it illustrates in both the diagram on the left, sort of shear stress against strain, and then the one on the right, which is sort of a, a strength envelope in terms of a stress path. And it illustrates the general strain softening response coming to the, some liquefied undrained strength at large deformations. And so if you look at a stress state at A, uh, the, the one that tends to come to mind is if you have undrained loading. So if you load it rapidly undrained, it'll rise to a peak, hit some sort of yield uh, envelope or, uh, or yield, uh, what we refer to strength envelope here, but it's a yield envelope. And then it strain softens down to its uh, ultimate uh, liquefied undrained strength, which is much lower than the initial shear stress up at A. And so you get a loss of strength. Um, another one, of course, is the cyclic loading from A prime. It can cyclically load over, hits the yield envelope, and then strain softens to C. But the other one uh, that he's also shown, which is quite nice, is A to D. And this could be, for example, a steep slope where you have a rising phreatic surface. And so as the phreatic surface rises, uh, the shear stress essentially doesn't change very much, but the effective stress uh, decreases and then eventually hits the yield envelope and collapses uh, to the liquefied undrained strength. And that's a, a particularly dangerous one because you don't see it coming. Uh, you, the phreatic surface might be rising. You're seeing no deformation. And then suddenly, bam, uh, strain softening occurs and uh, instability uh, results. So the sequence for steeply sloping ground, generally you know, greater than five degrees of sort of earth embankments, tailings, dams, etc. So the sequence is, first of all, is the material susceptible to strength loss? So is it contractive at large strains and therefore has the potential for a loss of strength? And then you then uh, assume that it will strain soften. You uh, calculate the stability, determine if it's stable or not, uh, and then you uh, evaluate the trigger. But based on the case histories, usually what happens is if the soils are susceptible to strength loss and uh, 
assuming the liquefied undrained strength and put that into a stability analysis, if you find that the factor of safety is significantly less than one, so therefore instability is possible, then it's often prudent to assume that the trigger will occur. So often for, for flow or static liquefaction, the trigger is a less important role and really it's, it's the susceptibility and then the liquefied undrained strength tends to dominate the thinking. And you'll see that reflected in the software um, because it doesn't, tries not to link the two. Um, so in terms of case histories, I published a paper about uh, six, six years ago in ASC where I looked at a bunch of case histories and I, I particularly focused in the ones that had high quality CPT data so I could plot that CPT. And what it clearly showed is all of the case histories plot on the dilative portion of the CPT soil behavior type chart. And this boundary, which I suggested could be captured in a simplistic way by the normalized clean sand equivalent cone resistance of about 70. Um, and this is supported by uh, most of the work that people like uh, Bean and Jeffries have done over the years on state parameter, that their boundary is essentially very similar to that uh, that separates contractive and, and dilative material. Some of the things to notice here, uh, the stress level for most of the case histories are very low. They're generally less than about two atmospheres, 200 kPa. Um, so high stress, the behavior tends to change a little bit. If I look at that same boundary and you look at the case histories from cyclic liquefaction, you can see that um, roughly half of them plot in the dilative region. And this often confuses people where they say, hey, how come I've got a dilative sand, but I'm, I'm, the program's telling me that cyclic liquefaction can occur. And of course, the reason that happens is that uh, soils that, that are dilative at large strain um, tend to be contractive at small strains. And so they will develop positive pore pressure during cyclic loading. So they can experience some softening, some loss of effective stress and deformations uh, can occur. They do tend to be smaller than the looser sands, and of course if you've got a, a loose contractive sand, then the deformations can be very high when they reach zero effective stress. And in the last um, webinar, I sort of uh, talked about the updated uh, normalized soil behavior type charts where I changed the boundaries a little bit. I, I put in the contractive dilative boundary there, shown as 70. Uh, sort of I gave a sort of simplified formula for it to make it a little bit easier to calculate. And I modified the boundaries, sort of made them more hyperbolic in, in shape, consistent with experience in the last 10 years that they needed to be tightened up a little bit on the high end. And I've shown as an example, there's approximately the boundary of IC of 2.6. And you see that you, you can have uh, sand-like dilative materials and sand-like contractive materials. And sometimes these sort of slightly transitional materials, which tend to be the siltier materials, um, can sneak in there as well. Uh, but we covered that uh, in the previous webinar. And notice too that it applies, this chart applies primarily to young, uncemented, silica-based soils. You know, as the soils become either much older or, and or cemented, these charts tend not to work so well. And we covered that in the previous webinar. So I want to get on to the software. So here it is. Um, it's pronounced Slick. Slick version 2 is what we're going to talk about. And it's produced by Geologist Mickey. And uh, Geologist Mickey is run by John Ioannidis. And John and I have worked together um, you know, with the sponsorship of Greg uh, to help develop both the previous C Petite software and this Slick one. And uh, you know, those that, that are interested, it, it sells for only 200 and um, 49 um, euros, which is um, roughly about $300. Um, so hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll see that it's a, it's a pretty good deal uh, on what it's capable of doing for such a small amount of money. I always try and remind people I don't get any return for the sale of this, nor does Greg. Um, we spend time uh, developing it because we want to see people use the CPT in more effective ways. Um, so, you know, I talk about it through enthusiasm, not because I'm, I'm profiting from it. Uh, so I'm going to go through some worked examples, and it was, it's always difficult to choose good examples. So what I did is I, I went to a publication by uh, Professor Russell Green at uh, Virginia Tech, and he uh, selected about 25 case histories from the Canterbury earthquake sequence in 2010 to 2011, documented them very uh, carefully, so they're public domain uh, 
uh, data and he shared the digital data and so the 25 cases I narrowed it down to 10 partly because I didn't want to cover too many uh, in such a short period of time and also some of them the CPTs didn't go that deep and so I tended to screen them I only picked out ones where the CPTs were greater than about 10 or 12 meters in depth so I, I didn't want to uh, have examples where maybe the CPT had uh, stopped a little short and may affect the interpretation. Uh, so I thinned it down a little bit uh, using that method and he had looked at the two main earthquakes. Um, I probably will only have time to go with the main one, the Christchurch one which occurred in February 22nd of 2011. That was a magnitude six and a half but it occurred very close to Christchurch and so the peak ground accelerations were quite large on average around 0.3 you know, in, in the central part of Christchurch. Uh, compared to the Darfield uh, earthquake which occurred in September the year before, that was a slightly bigger magnitude but it was further away and so the peak ground acceleration in the city was about 0.2, a little bit less. And it's actually quite nice to look at both of them because on some of the sites liquefaction did occur in the Christchurch earthquake but didn't occur in the Darfield or to be correct, when I say did occur, I mean it's, it's really the observation of surface damage. So when I talk about liquefaction occurring or not occurring, we're really talking about the observation of, of the strict term is surface manifestation or some element of damage on the surface. So uh, I borrowed this diagram from uh, uh, the group in um, New Zealand and uh, this is one of the many plots that they show that sort of show the amount of uh, building damage. This is in New Zealand dollars and essentially the red is where most of the damage occur. Um, the um, orange uh, slightly less, green less and then blue very little. But you can see most of the damage uh, close to the Avon River going through. And so in picking the 10 sites I actually look to see where they are and this is where, well, at least where seven of them are. There's a couple in downtown Christchurch, there's one over by the park near the Avon River, there's one in a community called Shirley and then a couple over in sort of the north end of New Brighton. And then there's three that's north of, of Christchurch that sort of are off this map. I didn't want to make the map too small, I wanted to be similar to the previous one. So that's roughly the distribution of the 10. So what, I, what I'll do now is I'll switch over uh, to the software and uh, with the previous webinar what we did is we used CPT and what I encourage people to do is ideally you want to load the CPT data into CPT first so you can have a look at the data, um, interpret it in a general sense of the types of soils and conditions that you're dealing with, the groundwater conditions, etc. Um, and uh, I went through how to do that here. You can see that you've got a file management to the left, the plots in the middle and, the, and the, the digital data showing above. I'll make the plots a little bit larger. And rather than load the data individually as we went through in the previous one, I'm just going to load uh, an existing uh, project file that has it in. Here it is. And so if I load it in, uh, here they all are. I'll just make the uh, file management a little bit clearer. So you can see there's 10 of them and they're labeled uh, well, they, he had 25 sites, so they're actually labeled 1 through to 24. That was the site numbers he gave them. And I've written next to them sort of the level of damage that they got, at least in the Christchurch earthquake, that uh, magnitude 6.21. And so if I click on one of them, you can see it. And if I go to the basic plots, I've chosen that option to have the water table visible and coloring underneath the tip resistance. So when you see the, the brown and the orange, you know it's mostly sand, so this profile is mostly sand. They'd obviously um, hand over or pre drill the first meter and then push down to about 15 meters. And you see it's mostly sand, a, a weaker layer around four and a half to five meters. Uh, the poor pressure, close to hydrostatic. <clears throat> and if I quickly flip through them, you'll see that, um, that they're, of course, in widely different areas. So this one you can see has a more clay, a little bit of sand at the top, then mostly clay with some thin interbeds and then some sand deeper down. And so uh, by loading it into C Petit, you can have a good look at the data. And in the uh, information that was provided, um, they did have sort of average shear wave velocity in the upper 12 meters. And so if I go to the parameters, so here's, uh, I, I, so I took that average shear wave velocity and I uh, 
uh, made it sort of vary so that the, the average number at six meters is the number they gave, and uh, they said it was down to 12 meters, so I put a sort of a simple linear variation. They didn't have the detailed profile. It's not bad. In fact, you see if I go through them randomly here, you'll see that yeah, they're generally not a bad fit. This one may be a little bit better. Uh, and the reason I did that is you may recall from the uh, previous webinar that when I'd updated the soil behavior type chart, so here's the, the, the normalized tip and friction ratio, then there's the pore pressure one in the middle, and the one on the end is the one based on shear wave velocity. And you can see that if I flip through them, uh, all of these sites, the, this, this normalized um, rigidity index, this KG parameter, uh, that if it falls between 100 and 330, then that's typically where young, uncemented, sort of well-behaved soils tend to fit. And all of these sites, at least based on that average shear wave velocity, sort of linearized, you know, increasing with depth, um, they all fit within that band. Some a little bit higher than others, some are, are lower, uh, but generally they're all fitting within that band. You know, going on the fact that all of this is based on just an average shear wave velocity that was provided. So there's obviously some approximation there. Um, and you can see in, in that first one, you know, we said it was mostly sand. And if you go to the normalized soil behavior type, it in fact mostly is a dilative sand. Um, so here's a, an example where it's predominantly a dilative sand, but liquefaction did occur under fairly severe uh, loading. So I, you know, I've obviously gone through that. Um, you can look at the, uh, the, the, the profiles. Here it is in terms of relative density. You can see the weaker layer and so on. So if I, if I now uh, close that and open up Slick, um, what I normally would recommend that people do is you open Slick and, and um, uh, what you can do is you can um, of course, load in the data individually, but if you've already loaded it into C Petite, one option is you import the data. You notice that the look and feel is, is similar. So I have an option to import from a C Petite project file. So uh, I'll load in uh, exactly that one we were just looking at. And so here it is. And of course, it's, it's uh, reminding me that I need to um, uh, perform a calculation to update the files. And so here they are, they're all loaded in now, and here they are presented. Uh, and so one of the first things you want to do, of course, is they've, they've all got the varying scales again, because they're based on maximum and minimum values. And so uh, the first thing to do is adjust the scales, and just as within CPT, you can do it on the individual plots by either going to the depth scale and um, fixing the scales at some convenient number. Here I'll go 0 to 15 and apply them to all the plots. And uh, you can do this to all the plots. And of course, once you fix the scales, by then double clicking, I can then apply that to all of the CPT files. Uh, so they're, they're all fixed to that. I'm not going to do that because another option is that I've done this before, and so I've got a set of default uh, values. And by just clicking this little button up here, um, this allows me to load the default values. And it says, do you want to apply your default values? And, to all the CPTs, and if I say yes, then immediately I fix the scales. Um, so now all the scales are the same, so if I go through them, you'll see that um, the scales are not changing, just the data is changing. That's always a good thing to do, because when you go to re reporting out and producing plots of these, then you, you don't want the scales to keep changing on you, you want them to be nice and fixed. So let me just go through the basic uh, plots that exist. Just like with CPT, you've got the, the digital data up here that you can look at. And just like CPT, if I press the shift key and go to one of the plots, it'll actually take me to that data. Sorry. Um, so it actually show me that data as I can look at the, the digital data. And just like CPT, I can zoom in on the data. So I can left click and scroll and zoom in on the data if I want to interrogate the data some more. So and to unzoom, I left click and scroll up, and it gets me out of it. So exactly the same features as CPT for adjusting the scales uh, and for zooming in and actually looking at the digital data. Um, same procedures. Um, now the series of plots, uh, in terms of interpretation, so I've got sort of the basic plots, and then I've got the normalized plots. And then if I go up to the liquefaction 
tab up here, um, you'll see that uh, these plots vary depending on the method. Now that it's defaulted to the NCR method, which is the method that uh, Catherine Wright and I developed um, close to 20 years ago now. Uh, and so you've got uh, the tip resistance, the, soil, the normalized soil behavior type index, then the normalized tip resistance, and then this um, grain characteristics factor, sometimes referred to as the fines correction factor, um, and in the NCO method it's referred to as KC, and you see it's mostly sand, so it's one, there is no correction. And then you've got the clean sand equivalent curve. And then the, the, the next set of plots is the cyclic liquefaction plots. And so the one on the left, oh, I'll just make these a little bit larger. The one on the left is the red line that's a smooth curve is the cyclic stress ratio for the earthquake. And I'll show you how, how we input that in a moment. And then the purple curve is the cyclic um, resistance ratio. Let's go up to CPT1 a little bit easier. So this is the, the one that was, if I just remind myself, here it is. So this is the one that was mostly sand with a weaker layer at four and a half to five meters. And so sure enough, uh, you can see that the cyclic resistance ratio drops at that four and a half to five meters, indicating that that's where liquefaction would occur. The next plot is um, factor of safety. And you see that uh, one here is the, the boundary between the yellow and the green. Of course, red starts, goes red at about a factor of safety of about 0.7. And that's because of the, sort of the, the little bit of conservatism built into the uh, trigger mechanism, the trigger curve. So here you can see factor of safety dropping below one and coming back. So these two plots tend to mirror each other. Um, and then the next one is the liquefaction potential index. This is that index that Iwasaki has suggested as a way of sort of summing up the effects uh, of liquefaction. So whenever the factor of safety drops less than one, then you start summing it up. And so you can see it builds up to, to create this index value at the surface. And uh, they coded, you know, sort of the uh, green area where little damage would occur, orange where uh, more damage would occur, and red where maybe significant damage would occur. And then you've got plots of settlement and lateral displacement. And I'll show you how you adjust the the parameters that actually get this. Right now, I'm just quickly sort of illustrating what the plots look like. So that's cyclic liquefaction. And then the uh, analysis summary. Um, the plot on the left is the soil behavior type chart. You've got the boundary of uh, IC of 2.6. And then this other line is roughly that contractive dilative boundary. This was the early version, you know, based more on state parameter, which is coming straight on down. Don't worry about that for now. And I had defined these regions A1 and A2. A1 would be sort of the sand-like dilative regions that could experience cyclic liquefaction, uh, which is a function of the size and duration of the earthquake. And then A2 is where both cyclic liquefaction and flow liquefaction could occur in sandy-like soils. And then B are sort of essentially those um, dilative clay-like soils. And C is the contractive clay-like soils where you could get some cyclic softening as well as um, uh, flow liquefaction occur. And then the next plot is the cyclic stress ratio as a function of clean sand equivalent. It shows the trigger curve. Um, you know, the program's defaulted to the NCR one, so that's the one visible here. And then it shows the data, you know, uh, the, the whole profile, and of course, when some of it crosses over and, and crosses into the region of where liquefaction could occur. As you can see, so most of it's a dense sand, non-liquefiable, and then that one portion crosses over. And then we just recently added this thing on the right. These are, these are Ishihara's famous plots from 1985, where he sort of illustrated that um, the thickness of the surface non-liquefied soil uh, as a function of the thickness of the liquefied soil would control whether or not damage would occur. And so if the thickness of the surface non-liquefied soil is quite large, relative to the liquefied soil, then you may not see much surface damage. And he showed lines of different earthquake magnitude. And, and here the program actually, you'll see in a second, it def defaults to about 0.24 G. So it's highlighted the 0.3 G1. And uh, on this particular side, um, although some liquefaction was occurring, it's actually falling below uh, that line. So indicating that although some um, 
liquefaction could occur for, for the values that are in there, and you'll see them in a second, um, generally um, not much damage would occur. And then the last tab is really related to flow liquefaction, checking for strength loss. So you see plots of normalized cone resistance that finds uh, content correction, which is the grain characteristic factor. And then here's the clean sand equivalent. And the, the, the pink zone is basically when it drops below the clean sand equivalent of 70. So here, that little bit just drops below. And so this material is considered to be contracted. And then you've got the normalized soil behavior type index. And then on the far right, you've got um, the um, estimated liquefied undrained strength ratio. And you can see that when it drops below that 70, it's estimating that liquefied undrained strength is uh, roughly about 0.1. And if I change the scale, all of these plots, the scales can change. If I plot that to a larger scale, you'll now see the, the continuous line, which is uh, because it's the sand, you've got basically the peak undrained strength ratio, which is based on the tangent of the friction angle. So the program estimates the friction angle and then calculates the tan of that friction angle and says that's what the equivalent peak um, undrained strength ratio, which you can see is averaging about 0.8 to 0.9. And then where this contractive material is, it potentially could strain soften and, and lose a fairly significant portion of its strength. Uh, but this is a, a level ground site, so you know here it, it wasn't much of an issue. So the focus is on cyclic liquefaction. So that was a quick overview of the plots. Now, how do you actually interact with all of this? And, and that's controlled by this button up here, which is the analysis properties. And uh, compared to uh, CPT, it's a little bit more uh, complex. This is uh, there's more more things involved. And the first thing, of course, picking the method. So as I say, it defaults to, okay, a little bit of bias here, defaults to my method, the Robertson and Ride method from 98, uh, sort of uh, I'd updated it in 2009, and NSEER recommended it. And, uh, but there are others, you've got the Moss et al. method out of UC Berkeley in 2006, and then Idris and Bollinger uh, did their nomograph in 2008, and then they just recently updated it with Bollinger and Idris in, it says 2014, it actually appeared in ASC just um, uh, this year, but the uh, original UC Davis report was 2014. So you've got a choice of the method, and then of course it, it then says, okay, how big is the earthquake, and what's the peak ground acceleration, and then what's the groundwater table at the time you did the CPT, and what's the groundwater table that you estimate at the time of the earthquake? Now here, of course, we're looking at some case histories, but when you're doing design, then you have to estimate what you think um, usually the worst case scenario might be for the design. And, and here in California, people actually do have to take the worst case scenario. A little bit of a side is here in California, you know, there's a, a little bit of a disconnect between the sort of uh, the um, probability of the design earthquake occurring at the same time as the probability of the worst case earthquake. And so if you take the worst case groundwater uh, level at the time of the earthquake and the design earthquake, then sometimes you know, you're, you're actually um, reducing the probability or increasing the return period that you're designing for. But that's a, a slight aside. So that, that's the basic. And then just in, in, like with CPT, you've also got the option to put in a non-hydrostatic groundwater condition. Here, the groundwater conditions are roughly hydrostatic, so we're not going to do that. But, but if you could, you, what you do is you, you then put a table of values in here to try and define the piezometric profile, both at the time of the CPT and to what you think it might be at the time of the earthquake. But for now, we'll just go with hydrostatic. That actually does apply uh, to these case histories, so we're not going to worry too much about that. Now, before I go through all the other tabs, what I'll do is that uh, you see the program defaulted sort of average values of magnitude 7 and 2.4 G for peak ground acceleration, which is actually not a bad average number for these sites during these earthquakes, but what I'll do is I'll just cancel this, and what I'll do is I'll actually uh, load in um, a version, I won't save that, uh, where I actually did put in the correct magnitudes and um, uh, peak ground accelerations and magnitudes for the Christchurch earthquake. So you can see it's, it's the same data. They're now ordered a little bit differently. I switched the order from ones that had 
sort of the more severe damage at the top and then moderate and then no damage as I progress down through the list. So I flip the order a little bit. Uh, but they've all got the correct um, uh, magnitudes and, and groundwater tables and um, peak ground acceleration. So if I go back up to the plot, you now see that uh, for this particular site, you know, it was a magnitude 6.2 and it was about 0.35 at this location. And they estimated that the groundwater table at the time of the earthquake was two meters down, but when they did the CPT, it was only one and a half meters down. So that's the basic thing about the earthquake. And then there's a tab of advanced parameters. And okay, there's quite a lot of stuff here. <laughs> Let me just go to the, at the bottom. The first thing are the stress exponent to calculate the normalization and the magnitude scaling factors. The program defaults to using the, uh, those techniques that those methods defined. Uh, of course, some people like to be able to flip them around, so there are options to flip it a little bit if you want to see what the influence of different magnitude scaling factors are or different normalization uh, procedures. You know, because I had updated uh, the original one from Robertson and Ride, so you can update it. For, for profiles like this, they're all less than 15 meters. It really doesn't make a lot of difference. Uh, if you were dealing with much deeper profiles, the stress normalization might begin to play a bit of a role. But if I go down some of the choices, just like in CPT, the first one is averaging. Like a, it does a rolling average. Now you'll see if I, it defaults to three, but if I put it down to one, this is with no averaging. So if you look at this plot here, you'll see if I say okay, um, you'll just see just a little bit more detail. There's very little effect of averaging. And um, generally I find that a rolling average of, of three data points, assuming that you're collecting data every one or two centimeters, um, generally works pretty good. It just smooths it out very slightly, so I tend to default to that. Um, I, I've assumed that the net area ratio of the cones were all about 0.8. That's typical of a lot of manufacturers. They didn't actually specify it in the data, but most of the modern cones have net area ratios of about that. And as an interesting aside here, if I just cancel that, go back to the basic plot. So here's the basic uh, plot here. Um, occasionally I got at, get asked when people say, well, the program looks like it requires tip, friction, and pore pressure to run the analysis. What happens if I just have cone data that doesn't have pore pressure? I've just got tip and friction. Uh, does it mean I can't use the method or I can't use the software? And the answer is no. And that's because liquefaction generally occurs in sandy soils. And as you can see in most of these profiles, in sandy soils, the pore pressure uh, is close to the piezometric profile. So in other words, there's very little excess pore pressures during penetration. So, yeah, some of these profiles are a little bit better than others. Um, there's one. Uh, so you can see in the sandy region, it's essentially following the hydrostatic line, and then the clay regions, uh, it sort of goes positive or negative a little bit. But the bottom line is that there's not a lot of difference between the measured cone resistance, QC, and the corrected cone resistance, QT, in most sandy soils, because the tip resistance is very large. You can see here it's over 10 megapascals or over 100 atmospheres of stress. And so excess pore pressures of you know, maybe one atmosphere for a, um, a, a cone with a net area ratio of, of about 0.8, which means you're going to add only 20% of that one atmosphere to 100 atmospheres of tip stress. So it's a negligible effect. And so if you don't have pore pressure data, don't worry about it. You can still load in the data. Of course, pore pressure will show up as zero here. Um, and the analysis will be still pretty good, uh, at least for most sandy soils. Um, now, if you, if you are going to load in data that has no pore pressure, it's sometimes nice to put in a column of pore pressure that represents roughly the hydrostatic groundwater condition. So instead of showing zero pore pressure, um, it'll actually have something closer to hydrostatic, which is a little bit better. So let's go back to the liquefaction plot, go back to the um, uh, assessment parameters. Um, so there's the net area ratio. You do have the ability to limit the analysis. So if you've got a very deep cone profile, uh, maybe uh, you know, 40, 50 meters deep, uh, you can limit the analysis to whatever number you want. I mean, uh, it defaults to 20 meters. Here we don't need to do that. All of these soundings are less than 20 meters. Well, there's one at 24, but um, so it's it's not, I won't limit the analysis. 
Then, of course, it wants the unit weight. You can either put in a single value or you can put in a table of values, just like CPT could. Or most often, you know, as a first guess, it's not a bad idea just to have the program automatically estimate the unit weight based on the CPT profile. You'll see later that it's very easy to see what the influence is. Like you can, you can try an auto unit weight and then try a fixed one and see what the effect of, on the results is. Generally, it's not that much of an effect. It depends on the depth, um, but experience shows it doesn't um, have that much of an effect. Um, and then uh, there's a few other buttons. There's one up here, apply the K sigma correction. That gets selected if the method required it. So uh, generally most of the methods have it built in and so it automatically gets selected. But you do have an option to turn it off if you if you want to try and see what the effect is with or without it. Um, for CPT we talked about uh, auto uh, transition layer detection where if you select that you can then go looking for transition layers. Here of course it's all sand. There are no transition layers so it's, there's nothing to detect. Uh, but for other profiles, that's not true, so I'll go back to deselecting that. Um, and then uh, you've got the IC cutoff. Now, a lot of the methods, uh, you know, default to assuming that the cutoff of soil, like uh, with an IC of 2.6, so if it's greater than 2.6, you assume it's clay-like, and so it defaults to that 2.6, but it is a variable. You can change that number. And um, you know, when we first suggested that value of 2.6, we did say that it was an approximate boundary and, you know, it could vary. And so certainly the experience in Christchurch shows that probably it should be slightly lower for the Christchurch soils. Um, uh, but as a first go, 2.6 is, is not a bad starting point. Now, uh, that reminds me to comment here is that I, I know the example I'm showing here are some case histories, but um, Case histories have the beauty that we know what the answer is, and so therefore, when I show you some of the results, we you know we can link that a little bit to how well does it perform relative to the ob observation. Now, when you're doing design, you don't know what the answer is, and so from a design perspective, you follow a slightly different philosophy. And often, from a design perspective, you're generally being a little bit conservative because there's a lot of uh, variables involved here. There's a lot of uncertainty. Earthquakes are often probabilistic in nature, etc. Um, and so often you need to be a little bit conservative. But you'll see that the program's design, that it allows you to very quickly look at some of the major variables so that you can begin to try and make reasonable judgments on how you think the site will perform for a design earthquake sometime in the future. So designing for a future event is different than um, case histories in the past. And I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that when we show some of the charts. Most of the methods put a limit of the stress normalization of 1.7, which means at very shallow depth, it avoids the normalization increasing the normalized cone resistance to very large numbers. And so a lot of methods cut it off. I, I think the origin of that, it came from the SPT world. It was somewhat of an arbitrary number for, again, slight conservatism to avoid penetration resistance at shallow depth getting pushed to too high in numbers. But basically that, that only comes into play in the upper couple of meters. Um, so it's not that big an issue, but it does default to 1.7. You can change it if you like. You can also change the factor of safety. So it, of course, defaults to 1. The, the boundary would be based on 1, but you can shift the cyclic stress ratio, the demand curve, up and down based on moving that factor of safety. But most of the time it's, it's kept at 1. You do have an option to calculate or estimate the amount of settlement that can occur above the water table um, for dry sand settlement. And if you do that, um, that method has a built-in factor of two uh, for multi-directional loading. And so recently we added in a feature where it defaults to um, uh, reducing that uh, by the factor of two. In other words, we were finding it generally too conservative using that factor of two. So this is where it removes that. So you've got that option to either keep it in or remove it. You've also got an option to use custom cyclic stress ratio data. There's a way up here of loading that in. Um, I don't often use that, but uh, for some projects, you know, larger projects, if you actually do a complete um, seismic analysis uh, with different um, a large number of different uh, earthquake scenarios and you may 
calculate your own cyclic stress ratio as opposed to using the simplified method. And then there's a few features down here. I'll come back to that. One is to do with aging, etc. I'll show those a, a little bit later. And then, so you've got your list of different methods. So here's the NSEER method, um, you know, published by NSEER, Yaud et al. in 2001, which was for the CPT, essentially, it was the Robertson and Ride method. And then I sort of suggested an update that would include clay-like soils in 2009. And so here, because it's clay-like soils, you have to define the limits of volumetric strain and shear strain. And then you have to put a, a limit on the magnitude scaling factor here. So um, that was a small update. So if you've got a, a site that's got a lot of clay and you're interested to see whether or not the clays could soften in cyclic loading, then you can try that method. And then Moss et al. Um, did a sort of very similar to the Robertson and Ride method in a sense, um, a little bit different on how they did the fines content correction. Um, and they also developed uh, a series of curves based on different probabilities, and they recommended the, the curve with a 15% uh, probability. And then, as I said, Idris and Bollinger in 2008, and they had their own fines content correction. Uh, theirs was a little bit different. They didn't actually recommend using IC. They recommend using, so using the fines content, which I'm not a big fan of, because it's a physical characteristic as opposed to a behavioral characteristic. And uh, so they sort of recommended fines content. They gave their own correlation of linking fines content to soil behavior type IC. And so you've got a choice of either using the original Robertson Ride one or going with the one they recommended, or defining your own. If, you, if you've got your own data, you can, you can input your own data of fines content um, with depth, and, and it'll, it'll sort of, the program will um, uh, calculate its own alpha and beta values. But most people go with the ones that Idris and Bollinger recommended. And they likewise uh, included clay-like material. Uh, and for uh, checking for strength loss, they also had they had two correlations, one uh, if you assume some void redistribution occurring. And then um, uh, quite, uh, you have an option of actually using the Zhang et al. method for settlement and putting a limit on the shear strain for the lateral displacement index. And then they updated the method, Bollinger and Idris. Um, they went more probabilistic. They recommended a 16% probability. They developed a different fines content correction. Um, and so they had this parameter for the fines content. It was sort of plus or minus, or, where zero would be their default average value, and so on. Um, and then at the bottom here, here's site conditions. You can say, yep, it's unchanged. Or if I'm adding fill, um, I, I can add so many meters of fill and whatever unit weight it is. But a little note here that reminds you, if you add like five meters of fill, you have to adjust the groundwater table during the earthquake by that five meters. Because during the earthquake, it's calculating from the ground surface, which now has five meters of fill. So let's say here the water table is two meters down. So if I added five meters of fill, then I have to go back up to the general parameters and adjust the groundwater table to seven meters to make it consistent. Uh, but we'll go with the same conditions. And of course, likewise, you can have an excavation. And uh, some people like to put in footing. So if you were excavating and then putting a building load in, you can add that extra load to see what influence that would have. And then under lateral displacements, you can either have level ground where no lateral displacement will be calculated, or gently sloping ground. Um, you know, and it ranges from 0.1% uh, to 5%. And there's a little button here where you can um, weight the volumetric strains as a function of depth to avoid um, sort of an infinite slope going infinitely down in the cone profile. So if you had a 50 meter cone profile and you were calculating liquefaction you know, 30 meters down uh, under some large earthquake, this would avoid you adding in too much volumetric strain for the gentle slope. So you can have, turn that on or off. And then level ground with a free face, you put in uh, the distance from the toe of the free face and the height of the free face. And then based on a recommendation from case histories, you can ignore the displacements below uh, a depth greater than twice the height of the free face. Remember, so if your CPT is up on the level surface. So H takes you to the base of the, the, the free face, and then 2H would take you twice that depth down. And so it basically says ignore anything below that. And then 
uh, the other parameters. This is that new feature for the Ishihara uh, curves. And what we did is that this is where you can put the x and y coordinates in. Uh, so you can place it onto a map. You'll, I'll show you that later. You can also put the ground elevation in. And then and the ground elevation for the overlay plots. And then this Iwasaki's layer, so that's that Ishihara plot. Um, rather than just sum up every element of uh, soil that liquefied, you can get to control minimum layer thicknesses. So like it's defaulted to 0.3, so it basically says anything less than 0.3 or roughly a foot uh, thick, um, you could ignore in that um, um, summing up for Ishihara's plot. Well, so there's a lot there, a lot of, lot of variables. Now let's just see, um, let me, I won't recalculate. Um, so uh, what do we go through there? Um, I've got to remind myself what I was going to cover. Um, so I went through the basic elements there, uh, all of the options. Now let's go through the uh, um, analysis. So here you can see that um, you know for the, the earthquake that hit the Christchurch, liquefaction is in fact predicted. This is like the simplest profile. Remember this one was mostly sand, very, very simple. Liquefaction occurring at this depth. This is what most people agreed. And so um, so you, you get a factor of safety less than one, liquefaction potential index builds up, some settlement. Now it's level ground conditions, so there's no lateral displacement. So you can see there's, it's, this particular method is predicting about six centimeters uh, of settlement. And it was uh, described as moderate damage, so uh, that's actually about right. Um, so if you want to compare the methods, there's a tab up here that says analysis. Let's make sure I do the calculation all. Um, if I go up to analysis, there's a button called uh, methods analysis, and this is one that's often quite nice uh, to do because it compares all the methods. So if I click that, <coughs> um, you can see that I've selected, um, what is it, uh, five of them here. Uh, the ones that were mostly sand are selected here. Um, now you've got a choice of all the methods. I'll turn off a couple so that it doesn't get too crowd. I'm turning off the Robertson 2009 because that's when you include clay layers and um, that really is not a problem at any of these sites. I'm going to turn, um, I'll keep the moss one on. So we'll just look at a plot of vertical settlements and then so what it'll do, it'll perform the calculation on all five of those and give me a summary bar chart of the five CPTs I've selected uh, versus settlement. And I can adjust the scale. Um, so let's go to 40 centimeters to adjust the plot. And so here's comparing the methods. So what is it? This little pink one is the Robertson Ride method ends here. The blue one is Idris and Bollinger. Yellow is Moss. The red one is Bollinger and Idris. And so you can see, okay, for the Christchurch examples, there's a sort of a general trend. Uh, it seems that as the methods develop over years, they tend to get a little bit more conservative. Um, and you can see that the uh, the Bollinger and Idris one, at least for this earthquake, which is a magnitude 6.2, tends to be uh, more conservative than certainly the Robertson and, and Ride ones. And you can see the description down here. CPT-10 had no damage, one had moderate, and then these all had severe. And you can see that the methods are basically correct. The ones that had severe damage is predicting a lot more settlement than the one where no damage was observed. So in general, they're working reasonably well. You've got a choice. You can look at uh, plots of like liquefaction potential index. That's Iwasaki's parameter. Uh, again, green being down where um, uh, low risk of damage, the origin is a high risk, and then red being very high risk. And so you can see that where no damage would occur, they're all in fact predicting that it's a pretty low risk. And then where moderate damage, they're all sort of falling uh, into the high risk, you know, the, the Robertson arrived one just sneaking into it, the um, Bollinger and Igros one well into it. And then the others generally plotting up into the high to very high when uh, severe damage was observed. Now in, in Christchurch they suggested sort of a modification which was called the liquefaction severity number, which is sort of a, a bit of a twist that's combining the Zhang et al. settlement uh, with the weighting. And so if I flip to that, oh, I to remember to recalculate. Sorry, let me go back to the liquefaction. I maybe forgot to recalculate. Um, yeah, there we go. No, that's when it's recalculated. Um, 
So it doesn't change the comments I made, and here's the liquefaction severity I need to recalculate. And I need to change the scale a bit, because uh, their parameter is a bit different. <coughs> um, in fact, I think they got it geared that it can go up to 100. Um, so here you can see, yeah, again, you know, blue being you know little or no damage, green minor damage, yellow moderate damage, and then of course moderate to severe damages. And you can see in general, you know, the methods pretty good. They're they're, they're getting it about right. Um, but keep in mind there is a difference. Um, and then you've got uh, other plots you can look at too. Um, so this is a, a quite nice of comparing the method. You can turn a few off um, and update it. And if you just want to look at uh, Say that, yeah. So you know you you can play around with um, uh, looking at the different um, uh, parameters and comparing the different methods and adjusting the scales accordingly. Um, so that that's a nice uh, option, particularly for design when you want to get a sense of how the methods compare um, and you know which ones you're going to put more weight on for your design. Um, is it, another nice feature that we've had is that. You can look at a single CPT here. We're looking at, at site number one. And this is a nice little feature, it's sort of a parametric analysis to see how sensitive the response is going to be to peak ground acceleration and magnitude. So, um, like for example, I'll change the magnitude, say, from 6 to um, 7.5, and I'll go acceleration from 0 up to 0.5, and I'll look at, say, overall settlement. And if I ask it to calculate, what it does is it calculates for all of those combinations of peak ground acceleration and mag magnitude for this site. And what you see, of course, is when the uh, peak ground acceleration is very low, there's, there's no liquefaction, and then liquefaction rapidly starts to occur, and then it begins to level off. And uh, at least for this earthquake, now if this was a design earthquake, you can see that the design earthquake is, is in the portion that's leveling off more. Um, you can see it is, it is influenced uh, by magnitude. You can see that there's quite a difference between the, uh, the magnitude 6 and the magnitude 7.5 um, for this particular site. Uh, but you quite often see that effect. A nice feature is if you left click, you can actually rotate this figure if you want to look at it from different angles. Um, so it's quite a nice feature to get a, a feel for um, how sensitive the site is, this particular site is, to both variability of um, magnitude of the earthquake as well as peak ground acceleration. And then there's another button where I, I can look at all five of them in terms of how sensitive um, the result is to the peak ground acceleration. Here I've selected settlement um, and so if I perform it, what it does is it shows me for all five of the ones I've selected, let me just change the scale a little bit, um, it shows you how sensitive the calculated post-earthquake settlements are as a function of peak ground acceleration. Now you may recall that at this particular site the PGA is around 0.35, so it's here, and you can see that for a number of the sites it's, it's not that sensitive to PGA. Now this one site, uh, which is site 17, um, you'll see later that this is um, I think a more interbedded um, site where um, the, the, the soil sort of um, across the cyclic stress ratio quite frequently, so it becomes quite sensitive. So that, that one is still reasonably sensitive to the PGA. Now keep in mind from a design perspective, although you may have a design magnitude and a, a design PGA, both of those you don't really know with any certainty. There's some uncertainty related to it. So although we're doing deterministic analysis here, it's recognizing the probabilistic nature of the earthquake and allows you to assess how sensitive the result is to that earthquake, that design earthquake. And each of these buttons I've looked at, by the way, uh, let me just do it again, there's a little report button down the bottom here where it'll plot out a little report um, uh, for you to look at. Um, so I went through those. Uh, I, I touched on this new feature, this surface manifestation. So I can adjust the minimum so minimum thickness, I'll go to 0.3 of a meter. And if I ask it to execute, what will happen is it now for the five I've selected, now um, there are three curves on Ishihara's uh, chart. You know, one is for like 0.2 G, the one is about 0.3, and the other one's 
0.4 to 0.5, and so this was about 0.35, so it's homed in on the third chart, which is sort of uh, less than 0.5, but greater than 0.3, and you can see that four of the sites are plotting in the region where it would say, yes, you would anticipate damage. These are all severe damage that was observed, uh, and the number behind it is the liquefaction potential index, and then this one, site number one, moderate damage was as uh, occurred and, and sure enough it's actually below the 0.35 line um, so obviously uh, it, this method would have sort of suggested that it would be less severe than these other sites so that's an interesting uh, option to look at as well. Um, now uh, I had suggested to Professor Yuang at Clemson University that um, um, the Zhang et al. settlement method was deterministic and maybe he should look at the case histories and put some sort of probabilities on it and so he did that and published it and it was a very nice paper I think in the Canadian journal and so this allows you to uh, compare the the settlement in, in this case you know it was Zhang et al. which is the red value compared to the probabilistic so here it is in terms of probability density and sort of showing that the peak density is slightly less than what Zhang would have predicted and then here is the um, probability of exceedance with the with the 50% one being around 5 uh, which is slightly smaller than the Zhang value of about um, 5.4 no yeah 5.4 uh, and this is for free field and Zhang also looked at where there are buildings and you can just update it and what you've not saying from Professor Yuang, uh, he, up, you know, he shows that there's more uncertainty when you introduce buildings and so um, using that method you can sort of see that effect a little bit. Remember these are all free field calculations but um, that method just allows you to, to look for alternatives. Um, now there is another button here. So in this particular site, liquefaction is you know, predicted to occur and, and actually did occur roughly between four and six meters, this, this softer layer. If you're thinking about doing ground improvement, we did add a button up here where it says, okay, if I'm going to do ground improvement, then I can put in some design earthquake. Let, let's say it's a, a large one, seven, and, and uh, I'll keep it at 0.35. And I'm going to put a factor of safety of 1.2 to minimize the settlement. So if I ask it to calculate, what it will do is it calculates now what that um, cone resistance should be that would uh, be required to have a factor of safety of 1.2 under that earthquake, magnitude 7 PGA of 0.35, and you can see that it drops below in that uh, weak layer, and it's highlighted over here where it calculates what the delta uh, cone resistance is. Um, the red area being where you would need to do some ground improvement. And so this is just sort of saying, yes, that's where the ground improvement would need to be and that's how much improvement you would need to, to create. And in fact, if you do, uh, I've forgotten what this button does now. Um, oh yeah, the iterative procedure just then sort of um, assigns it to saying no change in the cone resistance over most of it, it's only just that one portion there. And in fact, you can create a CPT profile. If you press this button, it creates a, a copy of the profile uh, to this required value as an example of um, um, the cone resistance that would be required to get that factor of safety for that design earthquake. Ooh, okay. Now, a couple of buttons. Although it's a CPT-based, uh, let me just get rid of this. Um, since it is a CPT-based method, you do have the option to check SPT and shear wave velocity. So there's a button up here for SPT. So if you had SPT data, um, you can put it in here. Now, if, if you don't have it, you can sort of cheat. That's what I did here. Uh, if I just put in artificial depths here, when I press the tab button, it fills in uh, the row to sort of calculate an equivalent bloat count based on the CPT and equivalent fines content, etc. So it sort of created this uh, profile for me. And then if I look at the calculated, so it sort of shows, here's the NSEER method that was, sorry, back here, you see, it's the NSEER method that's selected. And so it shows the trigger curve and it shows most of the data being in the non-liquefied zone. There's one blow count that would plot below. And so here's the 
measure blow count, the N160 clean sand equivalent. And then here on the right is that cyclic resistance ratio, cyclic stress ratio plot, the red lines, the cyclic stress ratio. And then the, the, the faint brown line is the CPT one, and then the black line is the SPT one. Again, predicting that you, you, if you've done SPT, presumably you would have got one low blow count at about five meters if you were doing blow counts every foot. And you've got likewise a shear wave velocity method, same thing. You know, here's a set of um, shear wave values if I show the calculated, similar set of plots, and the blue line is the cyclic resistance ratio from the shear wave compared to the CPT. And you can see that this is a, a sand side, it's comparing very well, so everything's working uh, pretty well. If I go to a different profile, one that's uh, a little bit more complicated, I think it's site number five. And the site number five is a much more complicated site. Um, so this is uh, clays with interbedded sands, and the, the sands are deeper. Um, if I go to cyclic liquefaction, now you can see it's a, quite a sort of a messier plot because you're, you're moving in and out of uh, clays and sands. So every time um, the IC uh, exceeds 2.6, it says it's not liquefiable. And then you get a thin sand layer that comes back down again and it says it is liquefied, but these are very thin sand layers. They're, they're, you can see they're clearly less than the meter. They're, they're, in many places, less than a third of a meter. So they're quite thin little sand layers up here. And this is where you can play around with uh, some of the factors to see what impact it has. So remember, one of them was I said you could go into the advanced feature and you could uh, identify transition zones and remove them. So here they are, sort of default values. And if I apply that, um, and then I say, okay, if you if you watch this like this settlement profile here, you'll see how much of an effect it has. And here's the cyclic resistance ratio plot on the left. If I apply that, you'll see that there's quite a big difference. So by removing transition layers, it's removed uh, the, a lot of the, the the bigger influence of the those transitions in and out of all of those little sand layers, etc. It's really removed the effect quite a bit. So the settlement dropped down quite a bit, and then because it's calculating settlements down at like 13 and 15 and 16 meters way down here, um, you can also look at the option of weighting the volumetric strain as a function of depth. This was suggested. It's sort of built into the Iwasaki method, and it's Chetin at L had suggested it as an idea. So if you select that, it defaults to weighting it linearly down to 18 meters. So if I apply that, and you'll see now what it'll do is it sort of weight out the volumetric strains with depth. So now you can see that the settlements come down quite a bit. Now this was a site that did have a little bit of lateral spread, and so uh, some some samples were observed, and there was a, a free face nearby. So if I go up to the uh, lateral displacement, you can see it was level ground with a free face. Um, it was a, the river was about three meters deep. It's about 85 meters away, and I had selected to ignore greater than twice the free height. So if I if I deselect that, you'll see the influence. You know, quite a bit more lateral spread extending uh, to quite a long way down. You know, and when you think that the the depth of the free face is only um, three meters, so by the time you get to six meters, it's unlikely to have much significant shear stress down there. And, but you are calculating uh, liquefaction and some shear strains down at depth. So you can compare both with and without that factor and make a judgment on how much uh, is likely to affect your site. On this particular site, this is a scale of, of a meter. Um, so it's like a, uh, about a tenth of a meter lateral displacement predicted if you ignore twice the height of the free face. Um, one last feature. Um, is, you know, there's quite a, a few, I think I've covered most. One is reporting. You can, you can look at an overlay plot. So I've got five CPTs selected. You can look at all the different plots. Here, of course, it's a bit confusing because they're all different sites, so it looks a bit messy. But you do, if it's one site, you do have an option to look at overlay plots, of course, and you can deselect ones, and you can change colors, etc. just like in CPT. Um, and there was also there was also a feature of um, of um, uh, looking at in two dimensions. So um, what I actually did is uh, I I took I think four of these and I uh, you got this two D result. You can place them onto a map 
and then here I've chosen to contour settlements. The thing to avoid is, you know, and of course th these are not actually at one site, they're from four different sites, I'm just illustrating the feature. So what you do is you, if you've got the coordinates, you put them in and then place them onto the map and, and then tell it to contour, here I've contoured settlements. Now, the thing is not to believe the contours too much, but it's showing you the likely variation that's going to occur. You know, red being large amounts of settlement, blue being very little. So it's sort of, you know, I chose four that were sort of essentially no, no liquefaction to one that had lots of liquefaction. But it, uh, depending on the spacing of the CPT, if, the, if they're reasonably closely spaced, it'll give you some idea of the variability. The further apart they are, the less reliable this gets. But it does give you some idea of, uh, of, the, uh, of the variability of the site and therefore guiding you on the decision of, of appropriate design uh, for a future earthquake. Here, of course, we're looking at case history, so we actually do have some idea what the uh, result is. Um, so you can see that it's a pretty sophisticated program. It gives you a lot of control over um, what you can do, uh, uh, particularly under this uh, uh, advanced parameters. I covered them. There is an aging factor, so if you know if that if the shear wave velocity is indicating that the soils are aged, then um, Anderson uh, had a, a method of uh, correcting for aging, so you can select that and put a factor that's greater than one um, uh, to, to include an aging effect. And if you've got, let me go back to that interbedded site. So this was the interbedded sands and clays, and so um, you, know, you can see that uh, you know the IC of 2.6, you, you do have an option to um, to change that in the advanced parameters, you can um, you know, raise or lower that cutoff uh, accordingly, um, maybe based on samples, etc. And then there's a little feature down here for ground improvement, a shift in IC if you've, if you've done CPTs after ground improvement and there's been a shift in the IC due to the densification, then this allows you to shift it back to the pre-improvement IC to avoid penalizing yourself too much for that change that occurs. Okay, I, I, I covered quite a lot there. You can see the program's got a lot of features in it. Um, uh, we can switch over to questions now um, because they may highlight some of the things I, I missed. Um, so uh, first one is, can you enter in a percent fines from lab data? And the answer is yes. Um, now if you're using uh, the Robertson ride method, the answer one, the answer is no because um, it doesn't require fines content, it uses IC directly. But for example, if you're using the um, um, Idris and Bollinger or Bollinger and Idris method that does require a fines content, and so let's assume that maybe you did um, um, go and collect some data, then you do have the ability to enter the depth uh, from and to, and then the fines content, and then the program will try to calculate the uh, parameter that suits the, their equation. So here, like the Bollinger and Idris one, where it uses this C factor for fines content, um, and so it will try to calculate that for you. Generally, I don't sort of recommend doing that too much because you need to have a lot of fines content um, samples to make that worthwhile because you, know, you take some of these profiles, you know, even the simple one that was mostly sand, um, you can see IC is varying quite a bit even though that this is sand, it's varying from as low as one to as high as two. Um, and if you look at the chart, you know, it's plotting in a fairly large zone uh, on the chart. And this, this is predominantly um, a clean or slightly silty sand. Um, so you need a lot of samples to be able to get a reasonable number to come up with a site-specific correlation. Um, so I'm not a big fan of it, and as I've quoted in some presentations in the past, I'm also not a big fan of using fines content anyway, because uh, it is a physical characteristic uh, measured on disturbed um, samples, uh, and only has a very uh, weak link to behavior where the CPT soil behavior type index IC is a behavioral characteristic that has a strong link to behavior. And so, you know, back in you know, almost 20 years ago when 
Catherine and I suggested the method. We suggested sort of moving away from Fine's content and moving more towards IC, and we sort of showed that there was a link between Fine's content and IC, but it was also very much a function of the plasticity of the Fine's. And you know, most of the case histories come from sites where the plasticity of the Fine's is generally low. That's why they're liquefying. And so uh, um, our, our relationships tend to be biased a little bit that way. Uh, so if you go to different parts of the world where the plasticity of the fines can vary, then those correlations can be off by quite a bit, and that's why I tend to prefer IC. So uh, that's always a tricky topic for me because I'm not a big fan of fines content, and I'm encouraging industry to move away from it uh, because it is a, a physical characteristic that only has a very loose link to behavior. Next question, can you explain the remove loose sand condition? Okay, good question. I, I skipped by that one. So in the advanced criteria, there's a little button here, remove the loose land, sand criteria. Well, in the original Robertson and Ride method, we had suggested that there was a zone in here uh, where you know, basic, basically where that A2 zone is. So a loose contractive sand, it could in fact be a clean sand, it's just that it's very loose. But um, the way um, you know, the correction is based on IC, then if it's very loose, then it appears as if it's a silty sand. And so the original Robertson and Ride method that's embedded in the program um, um, takes that into account by saying, OK, if it falls within that region, we will treat it as a clean sand. So we will not use the IC to make a small sort of equivalent fines content correction. And so that was part of the original Robertson ride method. And so what this button does here is you can override that if you want to see the effect. Now here it won't have much effect because there's only a little bit that's falling into that region. So it probably will have, and, and the IC here is close to, well, in fact, if we go back, if, if, if I look at the um, KC parameter, you can see KC is essentially one all the way. There's just a little blip here where it's slightly bigger than one. So you can see if I uh, remove that on this particular profile, it wouldn't make any difference. So go back again. So if I go to so here's the result. If I if I um, remove that criteria by selecting the removed loose sand criteria and say okay, calculate, you'll see that almost no. There was just a little small effect of it moving over a little bit. So uh, on this particular sounding, it had almost no effect at all. If I go back, you'll see this will just move a little bit, and almost no difference in settlement. Um, so that, that's what that is. So next question, does the risk of lateral displacement analysis present cyclic liquefaction deformation, or is it static flow? Okay, I think I understand that. So um, if, uh, we're, we're, so here was the lateral spread. So this is one where there, there was um, uh, a free phase, so lateral displacement is calculated. Um, and uh, what you can see, it's not very large. And so if I go to the check for strength loss, um, uh, most of the profile it has a clean sound equivalent greater than 70. There are some spots, they're, they're always in the clay layer. So this clay layer here is dropping below, this clay layer here is dropping below. But most of the sand is in the dilative region. And so, hence, there's not likely to be much strength loss. So you can see that there's little tiny bits that are showing some strength loss. But even here, you can see that this this um, this clay layer right at three meters, uh, you know, not much strength loss in the sense of the liquefied undrained strength ratio is 0.3. So, you know, a normally consolidated clay would have an undrained strength ratio of about 0.25 to three. So, not much of a strength loss there. Um, but what you do tend to find is that if you, if you calculate very large lateral displacements, then often that's associated with uh, strength loss. And so the two are sort of mixing, whereas one, of course, is simply estimating the lateral displacement based on an empirical correlation of observations with case histories. The other one is saying, look, we think there is a risk of strength loss, and you could run a check stability. So you take the liquefied undrained strength ratio and run a a stability analysis check just to see if the factor of safety drops less than one and so that that lateral displacement actually turns into more of a uh, of a deformation pro uh, sorry uh, an instability problem rather than a lateral displacement 
um, displacement problem. So you know, there is a link between the two, and it's it's when you get into these very loose materials. Uh, now I didn't have time to cover it, but you know when you when you look at uh, strength loss, you know that's also a function of the plasticity of the soil and of course the stress level. You know more plastic clays tend to be more ductile and less brittle, and sands at higher confining pressure tend to be more ductile, um, and sands at low confining stress, if they're contracted at large strains, can tend to be more brittle. So there's, there's other factors that, that link between the deformation and the stability. So next question. In Christchurch, which method of liquefaction potential performed best? Well, that's the, uh, the big question. There's been a number of studies done on it. Uh, uh, Professor Green and others have done numerous studies. Um, they generally show that uh, all the methods are pretty close, but interesting enough, when you look at all 2,000 CPTs, the Idris and Bollinger won the, the more, no, sorry, not, the, the Bollinger and Idris one the more recent one, as well as the Idris and Bollinger 2008. So the 2008, 2014 one tend to give slightly better prediction when you look at all 20,000 uh, CPTs. Here I took just 10. I took the ones that Green had, and of course it, it showed that they tended to be more conservative uh, than the NSEER ones. The difficulty with that analysis that uh, has been done by people like Professor Green is that Mostly it's looking at a yes-no answer, you know, did it liquefy or not. It's not looking uh, so much at, at settlement, which is a more quantitative way of looking at it. And also, it was not uh, looking at some of the advanced features, such as removing transition uh, zones and weighting the volumetric strains with depth. It was not including those advanced features. And uh, I'm slightly biased, and uh, um, I, at the cases that I look at, um, in general, I find that they tend to be a little bit more conservative than, than the original Robertson Wright. But clearly, I'm slightly biased there. Um, but when you look at the statistics of Christchurch, statistically, the current publications are saying that either the Idris and Bollinger or Bollinger and Idris one are slightly better. When you look at the statistics, they're all pretty good. There's not a big deal of difference between them. But um, when, when they've studied it carefully, they sort of say it is slightly better. Um, so next question. In, in CPT5, which is site number five, um, did uh, calculated lateral displacements correlate with observed displacements given the options of limiting the depth calculation of the And the answer is yes, in general it did. Um, so this is where lateral displacement was observed. Um, in, in the case history, they didn't actually say what the displacement was. Um, I, I haven't seen a publication yet uh, where they actually talked about the exact uh, deformation that was observed, uh, but there were cracks, and so certainly in the order of 10 to 20 centimeters um, seems about right. Uh, where this CPT, this CPT was 85 meters uh, back, and, the, and there were some cracks and sand boils. They didn't actually quote how big the cracks were, but that number seems about right. And uh, if I had um, if I had not taken the 2H factor, uh, it predicts up around 30 centimeters, which one could argue is also about right. So this is not really a good example of distinguishing the two. I don't know enough about this particular one. Certainly there's lots of research done in the last year or two where people have honed in on the on the sites where lateral displacement occurred. And in general, what they found is that lateral displacements occurred um, frequently along the River Avon area, and they extended l large distances back, you know, consistent with other case histories. It's, they're not just limited to, you know, maybe 50 meters from the river, but they tend to extend, you know, 100 or 200 meters further back, obviously getting progressively less, but the extent of these lateral displacements. And they're complicated by sloping ground, so it's not level ground with a free face, it's sort of a free face, and then often some sloping ground uh, that, that dominates the lateral displacement. So there's lots of variabilities, but in general, when we looked at the case histories, and there was a paper by Professor Stewart from the Taiwan earthquake a few years back, and he was the one that suggested limiting it to twice the height of the free face. So that's generally what I do. Next question. Um, 
is there a recommendation to correct the cyclic stress ratio for average shear stress applied at virus level? Uh, I mean, yes, I didn't, I didn't cover it, um, but in, the, in some of the methods, um, um, th there is a, um, a K-alpha correction for static shear stresses. Uh, if you read the NSEER uh, paper by Yao et al., you know, when, you know, they, as a consensus, they went through a lot of these issues. They have a little bit about this K-alpha correction. They generally said there's a, a, a quite a bit of uncertainty over it, and that in general, um, you know, it, it depends on the density of the sand. You know, if the sand is dilative, the correction goes one way. If it's contractive, it goes a, another way. But what you tend to find is that for steeply sloping ground, you know, where K-alpha plays more of a role, it's usually an issue of, of <coughs> checking for strength loss. In other words, checking whether or not flow liquefaction is likely to occur. If flow liquefaction is not likely to occur, then the issue is, well, how much deformation uh, could occur during an earthquake? Because instability is not going to occur, but deformations could occur during an earthquake, and that takes you down the path of, of the, the cyclic resistance ratio and the cyclic stress ratio, and there life gets a little bit more complicated, and these K-alpha corrections are clearly a very simplified view of it, and if it's a large project, high-risk project, then um, you need to you know, probably think about um, doing some lab testing and maybe even some numerical analysis to try and get a better answer of the type of deformation that would occur under the earthquake. So, as a, for flow liquefaction only, is SLIC the right program? Um, whew, well, there aren't many programs that will help you on flow liquefaction from what I understand. It's one of the few commercial programs that does in fact include a check for strength loss. Um, and so, um, yeah, it, 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 it's um, it, it probably I use it uh, because it does give me this this chart. It shows me where the data plots relative to the contractive dilative boundary, which is a key sort of opening position. Is the material susceptible to strength loss or not? You know, if it's contractant, it's susceptible to strength loss. Then you want to estimate well, is strength loss likely to occur? And if it is. How much? So, what's the liquefied undrained strength ratio? Then you run a stability analysis with that um, value in the layers that are, are susceptible. You run that um, stability analysis with the um, undrained strength ratio from the liquefied undrained strength in there, and you see whether or not um, it's stable or not. Uh, if it is unstable, then you don't really need to fuss over the triggering, because this triggering of cyclic stress ratio is geared primarily for level ground, so it's not really applicable to the steeply sloping ground, um, and you just assume that it will get triggered. Now, uh, next question. Um, under the assessment parameters, um, you can input a foundation load. Is it gross or net? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, let me go and have a look. Site conditions. Um, I think it's the, ooh, no. you've actually caught me on that, I'm not actually quite sure. Um, so it's excellent, I think it's the uh, gross load because you're taking the soil out and then you're adding that foundation load back in. So it's the, it's the gross foundation load because it's assuming that the soil is excavated. So if you excavate, say, two meters of soil and you put in a foundation with a say 100 kPa load, then that's the gross load from that foundation and, and it gives the dimension of the footing. So next one, in California for schools and hospitals, it requires liquefaction settlements to be calculated when factor of safety is 1.3 or less. Does slick account for this? The answer is yes. Under the advanced parameters, remember it said, you can put in the user factor of safety. It defaults to one, but you can put in you know, like you put in 1.2 uh, if you want to and rerun the calculation. So let's illustrate. Let's go back to the simple one, which is sand. It's a little bit easier to see. Um, if I go into the advanced one, so if I change the factor of safety to 1.5, say, you'll see now that the cyclic stress, or one of them will get moved. I forgot which one. So you'll now see this change over here. Yeah, so you can see the cyclic stress ratio increased by 50% because essentially that's what it did, is it, it, it 
created a, a built-in factor of safety by increasing the, the load from the earthquake by that factor. So if I put it back to one, you'll see it go back to its previous position. So you can see the effect. You notice that the, the settlement didn't change that much, and that's because you know liquefaction is occurring that layer, so the volumetric strains aren't changing that much when you change the factor of safety. Next one, when using uh, version 1.7, which is uh, the version one of the program, can you implement uh, full PGA for soil layers below groundwater and two-thirds above? The answer is uh, no. Um, the, the program, both version one and version two, it's only asking if you're a magnitude and a, uh, and a single PGA, and then it uses the, um, the stress reduction factors that the methods developed to um, calculate the simplified cyclic stress ratio distribution. Uh, so if you want to vary that cyclic stress ratio distribution, then you would have to put in a custom cyclic stress ratio data. And the button for that is up here. And this is where you put in the values of cyclic stress ratio. So you would have to determine that cyclic stress ratio profile, <coughs> input it here, and then select that button to uh, apply it. Okay, I think just we'll do a couple more questions. I know we're well past the time, but I assume a few of you are hanging in there. So which method of analysis is the most commonly used in the US? Um, there is no answer to that. Um, I don't know which one's the most commonly used. I think since Idris and Bollinger came out with their nomograph in 2008, I would say that's probably the most commonly used. Um, they've updated it recently, but it is very recent. So I suspect that a lot of people are using <coughs> the 2008 one. But as I say, you have the option to compare them. Um, so, you know, if you want to, like in settlement, so here they are, here's five CPTs. So you can see how they compare. I mean, this one, you know, there's a, like 17. 17 is uh, interbedded, um, not interbedded, but it's sort of, it's got a lot of sort of siltier zones in there. And so you can see there's a big difference between the two. In general, the difference isn't that big. Um, this is maybe not a, a good example, but um, uh, th this one seems to be showing quite a big difference. But in general, it's not that bad. What's the default for volumetric strain relations in slick? Um, well, <coughs> that's a good question. Um, it depends what method you chose. So um, if you chose um, the ENSEER method, that defaults to the Zhang et al method, which, which used ENSEER. If you choose Idris and Bollinger or Bollinger and Idris, they have their own um, settlement calculations and their own way of getting volumetric strains. But to be fair, we're all using the same curves. We're all using the Idris and, uh, not Idris, uh, the Yoshemini and Ishihara uh, lab curves for volumetric strains as a function of factor of safety and relative density. We're all using the same curves. We probably fitted them with slightly different equations, but they're all originating from that same set. So actually, they're all getting very similar uh, results. And if you want to, to compare, you could look at the Idris and Bollinger method and then look at the, uh, the volumetric strains and settlements using that, and then select uh, the settlements according to Zhang and see how much it changed. So um, you can see the influence. And the nice thing about it is you can see it almost immediately. So if I, if I go up, sorry, let me go. <clears throat> if, I, if I select like the Idris and uh, Bollinger 2014, tell it to calculate, and then say, okay, now, um, uh, oh, sorry, let me just go back. It's got to be the 2008 one. That's where the option is. So let's go 2008. Here it is. Um, and then if I come in and go to the 2008 and say, okay, now use the Zhang et al one and see, so here's the volumetric strain and say, okay, recalculate and see how much that changes. Oh, okay, it went down a little bit. Um, so there is, obviously you can see that there is a difference between the volumetric strains, but it's not so much the volumetric strain, it's actually the factor of safety. It's the difference in the factor of safety that dominates it more than the actual volumetric strain. But you know, it depends on, on uh, the actual values, of, you know, the, the equations they use. 
So uh, is it time to move from liquefaction potential index to the liquefaction severity number? I don't know, it's early days. The liquefaction severity number came out of Christchurch. Um, they suggested it as an improved approach, and there, it does have a lot of merits because <clears throat> it does um, weight, uh, it uses volumetric strains rather than just factor of safety, which is a great approach to go. And so it uses Zhang et al's volumetric strain method, but it then weights them versus depth. And as opposed to the linear weighting that the program gives you an option to use here, you know, this linear weighting, um, theirs is actually highly nonlinear because they just divide it by the depth, which is a highly nonlinear, and so it's a more, more rapid weighting. It, it, it decreases the weighting more rapidly with depth than uh, just doing the simple linear weighting. Uh, so I think in general, yes, uh, it has merit, but as they're using it more, they're also finding that it's not perfect. Uh, but I would say yes, it, you know, in general, moving away from that, that simple approach, which was close to 30 years ago now from Iwasaki, to the more updated version coming out of the New Zealand group for, for the Christchurch earthquake. So last question then, um, what method, NSEER or updated NSEER, would you recommend for plotting the method analysis bars? Oh, yeah. If it's sand, like in this particular profile, sorry, let me go back. If it's sand, uh, so if I go up to the, the bars, um, and uh, so if, if I just take out a couple so it doesn't get too crowded. <clears throat> so you can see that you've got the Robertson, which is Robertson ride, and then you've got the updated Robertson. You can see there's no difference. And that's because I, these are all the sand profiles. So if I added in uh, one that's got more clay, I'll add in this one. So number five, I think, has more clay in it. And then I do the comparison. Um, again, vertical settlement. Uh, so again, not much difference. So where's the one? Uh, here is, yeah. So on this one for, for clay, because it's very well-defined clay, going from sand to clay, there's no difference. Um, I'll, I, and this, this is in terms of vertical settlement. And that's because uh, the clays are, um, Okay, what what I got to do? I I know what I got to do. I've got to I've got to actually go and say. Um, sorry. The answer method. Okay, tell it to use the updated. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> now what you'll see here is there's almost no difference because the clays are actually relatively stiff. So you can see that now it's a truly continuous profile. There are no gaps now. I mean, it looks like gaps if I, if I increase the scale. You'll see it's fully continuous now. There are no gaps. But basically what it says is in the clay layers, the clay is actually relatively stiff, and so there is no softening. So in this particular case, there, there is no difference. So it's, it's nice to compare the two. If you do see a big difference, um, then go back and look at the profile and look at the clay layers, and then maybe jump back to CPT and determine what the undrained strength ratio and OCR of those clays are. Because if the OCR is greater than four, then basically you, you know, it's going to take a very, very large earthquake to, to cause any softening of those stiffer clays. Okay, we've gone well over our time. Uh, obviously, some of you maybe are hanging in there. <clears throat> Hopefully, you found that interesting. Uh, you can see that... Um, the program's very powerful, it gives the user a lot of control, so for design, and remember for design there's no right answer, you don't know what the right answer is. And so when you're designing for liquefaction analysis, um, you need to uh, look at some of the variables uh, that will guide you on making a reasonable decision where the decision is often dominated by the risk of the project. So the higher the risk, generally the more conservative you need to be. The lower the risk, Maybe you can push it a little bit more, but it's a function of the risk of the project and, and uh, the consequences of getting it wrong, etc. So the program's designed to give you all of those tools. So it, one last closing comment then is uh, John did suggest that we could give a free license out for the software. So what we'll do is we'll uh, we'll randomly we'll, we'll each of the registrants is a number. We'll assign. We'll randomly pick a number and, and uh, we'll give the lucky winner, uh, a free license to Slick and probably include CPT as well because you know we like to see them used together. So uh, someone will get an email in the next 24 hours saying you're the lucky winner and you get uh, 
uh, a license to both C Petite and Slick uh, for hanging in um, for, for the uh, close to two hours. Hopefully that uh, was worthwhile and you, and you got something. Uh, do feel free to uh, send me any further questions by emails and of course it will be recorded so you can look at the slides as well as the, uh, the video uh, afterwards um, if there are bits that you were uncertain of. Thank you for attending.